Welcome into the DNVR Rockies podcast brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. Now when you sign up using promo code DNVR, new customers, all you got to do is place a $5 bet on the NFL playoffs this weekend. And when your team wins, you get $200 in free bets with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. You do that with code DNVR. I'm your host, Patrick Lyons. And joining me today, all the way from California and the California League, one of the top prospect pundits in the game, Mr. Kyle Glazer of Baseball America. Kyle, how are you doing this morning? Good, Patrick. Gl- glad to be on with you. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you, you taking out some time and and talking about for what we have here in Denver is you know the, the farm system. That's we're all we've got our eyes on 2025, and it seems like maybe the Rockies do as well. Uh, but their farm system is is really exciting. I'm looking forward to to talking about uh, a bunch of those guys and and a lot of the work that that uh, you do over on Baseball America. I thought it it might be fitting to in, instead of starting talking about the Rockies, talking about their division rival, Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, you just uh, did a chat all about the Dodgers prospects, and I think you know we all know the Dodgers do everything right. <laughs> how how is that? How is it that they're able to get everything right? Why are they always so stacked? Why is their farm system always so good and they can just refurbish from within or trade guys away and get the pieces they need? How are they able to do it year after year after year? Well, I wrote about this for us in a cover story for BA a few years ago. And the biggest thing with the Dodgers is like anything else in life, money. They invest a lot of money and resources into player development. They spend what it takes to hire the best coaches, have the best training facilities, have the best training staff. And they also have you know, a very, very large analytics department. That's something that's been talked about a lot, their use of technology. But they also have one of the largest scouting staffs in baseball. They understand it's a blend. It's not one or the other analytics or scouting. And look, this is a team that operates in the second largest market in the United States. They consistently sell out Dodger Stadium and um, bring in a lot of money from ticket sales and merchandise. And just on top of it, you know, by virtue of their television deal, I mean, they make a significant amount of money as well. So, and they take that money and they invest it in the base foundations of what makes an organization successful. Don't get me wrong, they spend a ton of money on big league payroll, but they also invest very, very heavily in their farm system. At the end of the day, there's no real shortcut around it. If you want the best, you kind of have to pay for it. The best coaches, the best facilities, um, having the best scouts, having the best analytics staff, and it pays off for them. They're able to really bring in a lot of the best players and help them get better. One of the biggest things they did is they were ahead of the curve on, hey, why are we giving minor leaguers peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and having them eat, you know, fast food? Let's bring in healthy food. We're trying to turn 18, 19 year old, you know, physically immature young men into professional athletes. They need top of the line food. They need good sleep. So the Dodgers were really at the forefront of nutrition and and sleep and, you know, not having them just do the typical minor league lifestyle. And I've talked to a lot of evaluators about that for opposing teams. They've mentioned Dodgers players are often just in better shape than a lot of their, you know, opponents. And, you know, all those things go into it. Um, But the base of it is, look, they have a lot of money and they use it wisely to invest in player development. Yeah, everyone's looking for that edge, right? And and that is kind of a an untapped resource, like like you said, the 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 nutrition levels of these young guys. I know they've they've I've heard they've done other things where you know they'll go in and and they'll they'll hook you up to all the wires and uh, with with everything all, all over your body to figure out where you're weak, what are you favoring? Maybe it was an old injury to balance you out just a little bit and try to get a little bit extra juice uh, out of that squeeze. You know, uh, I've I've joked in the past the and I've almost lived my life this way uh, to the detriment of, of myself uh, at times. But if you take care of the little things, the big things take care of themselves. Uh, and, and it very much sounds like, you know, the Dodgers do that. And they've, they've been ahead of the curve, as you said, doing it that way, as you've described, versus, you know, just like the Mets, where just signing the free agents, kind of like how the Yankees were a lot uh, in the early 2000s, just signing every, you know, superstar. They're trying to develop uh, not only their own superstars, but as you said, get a little bit more out of those bench players, those those role players, make them, you know, hit the ground running as soon as they get called up from the minor leagues. You're going to do that if you're if you're taking all taking care of all of those little things really well. Yeah, again, the Dodgers, that's been their signature, taking guys who are kind of discarded or cast off from other team and unlocking something from them. You know, you look at Max Monty, you look at Chris Taylor, and obviously those guys aren't guys who came up through their farm system, but they're able to do things to help identify, here's a flaw, here's a weakness, let's fix it. 
at a level other teams can. Some of that is they have the best coaches. They have the best technology. They have the best staffers who can identify this. They're not trying to, you know, cut corners on staff salaries. They're not trying to be an organization that says, oh, we're only going to do tech and analytics or we're only going to do scouting. They understand you have to have all of it. And it's also the people. You have to have the right people in place to help players get better. If you don't, you can give them all the technology in the world, but it's not going to translate. So there's no one singular thing with the Dodgers. They do a really good job of investing heavily in every avenue and every aspect and understanding that, look, at the end of the day, if you sign a bunch of free agents, but they don't have the homegrown complementary pieces to you know back them up or homegrown stars who are more affordable and cost controlled, you know, any window of opportunity you have is going to be very, very small if you have one at all. Um, the way the reason the Dodgers have been so dominant for a decade now is, you know, they they may have made sure it's sustainable by investing in every avenue of the organization um, down to what they're feeding their kids in rookie ball all the way to the major league payroll. Nothing is overlooked. Nothing. No, no corners are cut. They understand the importance of having a well-rounded organization. And look, again, that costs money and they're willing to spend it, which is important because not a lot of teams are. Yeah, there's there's four legs on a stool and uh, all of them, you need all of them for that, for that complete stability. And if you, you're cutting corners and you've got two or three legs, it's going to be a little bit wobbly. It's, it's not going to be as uh, functional. Now, uh, at Baseball America, you know, you guys are at, at, at the top of the pile as far as I, it, you know, my opinion is concerned uh, when it comes to knowing everything, seeing these guys with your own eyes and, and all, all 30 teams, you know, all, all, uh, all 120 affiliates, uh, including, you know, the complex leagues, including Dominican Summer League. You know, you have you have the list of the Dominican Summer League All-Stars. People are excited about 18-year-old Brian Betancourt, you know, first base prospect for the Rockies. But I think a lot of people would want to know behind the scenes because, you know, you hate their team. Whoever, no matter what team you're, you're, you're watching or you're a fan of, Kyle and all of Baseball America, they hate your team. Um, but... Uh, maybe you can explain why you don't hate their team and, and how you, you figure out these, these rankings, you know, one team versus another one through 30. How do you balance it? Is it just, do you have the best player versus everybody else's best players at a top five, top 10? What is that process like over at baseball America when you're ranking all the different farm systems in MLB? Yeah. So the first thing is we rank the top 30 prospects in every organization. And that's, you know, a continuous thing, you know, over the course of the entire year, it's talking to countless scouts, scouting directors, uh, team officials, minor league managers, you know, just everyone, pitching coaches, coordinators, uh, farm directors, anyone and everyone. Um, and it's also a, a balance of talking to opposing scouts about the players they're seeing. It's not just, oh, we want to know about the Rockies farm system. We're going to talk to the Rockies farm director and that's it. That's one call we make, but um, there's also calls with 10 scouts from opposing teams who have Rockies coverage and a lot of other people in the Rockies front office and all the minor league managers. I mean, we really have a comprehensive view of every farm system. Um, you know, we keep uh, a database of all our information. And uh, if you put it all into a Google Doc, every team would be 50 to 60 pages just of scouting reports and information for all these sources. So it's, uh, you know, I always tell people we're not scouts, we're reporters, we are journalists. And this is, a lot of reporting. I've been a big league beat writer. I've moved over to this side and, um, you know, different challenges, but the level of reporting at Baseball America is really unmatched from any anywhere I, I've, I've been or I've seen. Um, so that's really the first step. And part of that in those discussions with scouts, getting the right grades on players on the 20 to 80 scouting scale. You know, is this player a, a 50 grade player? You know, a guy who's a, a solid average major, major leaguer. Is he a 60 grade player? Somebody could be an all star. Is he a 40 grade player? You know, a utility man who's helpful, but not a standout. And once we get the right grades assigned to every player, which again is after countless conversations with, with all the people I talked about, and we also have access to a lot of data we look at and examine as well. We see players ourselves. We do a lot of video. It's really comprehensive. Um, we line up. Here's the top 30 prospects in every organization based on our reporting with the right grades. Then from there, uh, we have a few formulas that uh, JJ Cooper, our executive editor, has put together over you know, his 20 years of expertise at BA, looking at the values of each prospect, what a 60 grade pitcher tends to be worth, what a 60 grade hitter tends to be worth. And we put it all into an Excel doc and let that do the work for us. And it spits out, you know, a numeric value of, OK, here's you know the value of this team's prospects, a, a point system. And from there, that's our one to 30. So it's all it's math. I mean, it, start, it comes from reporting first and foremost on these players, how good they are, what the right grades are on them. 
then from there, taking those grades, putting them into our formulas that have been vetted and tweaked over the years to be pretty consistent and pretty solid. Uh, you know, we do a lot of looking back to make sure, okay, was this accurate in hindsight? And for the most part, the answer is yes. Um, and from there we line them up. Here's the point system. And sometimes there's something where it spits out something like, okay, we know that's not right. Intuitively something's wrong. Maybe a grade got inflated somewhere. So we'll tweak it a little bit. If we know something doesn't seem right, um, move a team up or down one or two spots. So it's not a hundred percent just points based, but no team that comes out, you know, second in points ends up 13th in our rankings. I mean, it's maybe one or two spots. So, um, it's a very, very, um, comprehensive process, I would say. So it's not like we just look at and say, oh, we like this team's prospects and not this team's. It's a lot of reporting, uh, a lot of data, and uh, ultimately it's a point system. Yeah, you take the emotion out of it. That that makes a lot of sense. I, I love spreadsheets too. So, I mean, you had me there. I was I was already convinced. I'm, I make spreadsheets for far too many things. I'm no notorious for that. Uh, uh, we're notorious here at the DNVR bar on the corner of Colfax, New York, for having a great time and giving all of our diehards 15% off Food, drink, you name it. 20% off all the gear at dnvrlocker.com. You're getting a free shirt every year with your annual membership. 20% off all of our tailgates. Uh, make sure you come out on Friday for the Breck Brew Mile High City Golden Ale uh, shirts. Uh, all kinds of giveaways. Free swag, you name it. When you're a diehard, we hook you up over here at dnvr.com. As far as Breck Brew goes, you can also tap into that Broncos country, no matter where you're at in the country. You know, you can go to breckbeer.com for the Breck Beer locator. It's a hometown craft beer of the Denver Broncos. The season is over. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. Either way, you can relax with some Broncos country with the Colorado Crush logo, 100% Colorado ingredients. It's the way to go for a 100% Colorado company. And as we said at the top of the show, man, postseason is here. The playoffs for the NFL wild card round is the way to go. And you got to check out all the wild card round action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. It's where I go for my picks. They are hooking you up with the no sweat bet all week, all week long. So you know what? If you're a new customer and you use code DNVR, your $5 bet can become $200 in free bets if your team wins. But guess what? With the no sweat bet, if you got an NFL pick that doesn't work out, even if you're not a new customer, they're going to hook you up with a $10 payback for you. So you can go ahead and bet it. Try again. Even when you lose, you still win with DraftKings Sportsbook. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code DNVR. New customers, all you got to do is bet $5 on any NFL team to win this week, even if it is an overwhelming favorite. You're going to look smart. You're going to feel good because you're going to have $200 in free bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook and only with code DNVR. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Well, Kyle, I know you run the uh, the Colorado or the California loop a little bit uh, in the Cal League, so you got to see a little bit of Ezekiel Tovar last year, Zach Veen. Those two guys are at the top of the list. I mean, do you have one guy that you think might have a better career? Is one going to start off, you know, with with more of a bang? We did see Tovar obviously at the end of last year. Uh, Veen should come up this year. What have been your your thoughts on Tovar and Veen one and two in the Rockies system right now? Yeah, so I got my first looks at both of them in 2021 when they came through uh, through Modesto or Lancaster, excuse me. I'm sorry, Fresno. The Rockies and during my time covering uh, the California League, the Rockies has gone from Modesto to Lancaster to Fresno. So I apologize, but um, I saw them come up in 2021 with Fresno, and obviously. You knew Zach Veen's name, just being a, a top 10 overall pick and a guy that was someone to watch. And going out there, it was really, really apparent that the Rockies had a, a good crop of talent coming up. Um, Zach Veen, Drew Romo, and Tovar all really, really stood out as, hey, all three of these guys are very good. Now it's low A. There's a long way to go. But all three of them, their, their talent was really, really apparent. At that time in the California League, that was kind of how they lined up. It was, you know, Veen's the stud, Romo's a really, really good catcher, and Tovar was probably third in that pecking order uh, just because he was a really good glove defensively. Offensively, he had some sock in his bat, especially for a, a littler guy at the time. He wasn't very physically developed yet, um, but it was a super aggressive approach. You weren't 100% sure how the bat was going to play. They fast forward a year to 2022 and, and Tovar comes out more physical. He's really, really improved offensively and he just shot to the head of the pack. I mean, that was one of those things where, again, you go back to 2021 and this is part of player development. Different players, you know, start to really take off at different times. Um, it was very clearly, you know, Veen 1, Romo 2, Tovar 3, all very good, but that was how they stacked up on that Fresno team. 
Uh, and then, I mean, Tovar, just give him credit for putting in the work and really just jumping ahead of the pack, uh, going up to double A, doing what he did, maintaining the defensive excellence while taking all those offensive strides was super impressive. You know, getting hurt, he only had a partial season, then jumping to triple A and getting up to the end, the majors, homering off Clayton Kershaw. I mean, it's it's really, really impressive what this kid has done. Um, he's pretty clearly the number one prospect in the system now. And we're putting together our top 100 right now. And You'll see he's going to be pretty high in our top 100 just when you look Ooh. at everything he's done, his ability, his skills, his tools, um, everything he can do defensively, the strides he's making offensively. There's still strides to go. The numbers were great last year in terms of how it's going to translate to the big league level. There's still a tinge of aggressiveness that, you know, you want to see him just kind of manage a little bit better because uh, big league pitchers can ex exploit that a little more than minor league pitchers. But um, he has a chance to be a really, really good prospect. And again, just give him credit for – putting in the work and taking off, he really has surged to the head of the pack. Yeah. Do you, he's, a, he's a smaller guy. I mean, we, we saw him last year, 21 years old, shortstop, you know, can pick it. The, the glove is, was there. I mean, even when you saw him in, in 2021, uh, with, uh, with Fresno. So yeah, you got me thinking about Lancaster too, uh, in the farm system. We're nuts. If we think Modesto was, was still affiliated a few years ago, there's a good callback, but you know, big league glove already, the bat, as you said, man, he just he just flew ahead so quickly, developed in that way. For small guys like that, you've, you've seen him before at, at 18, 19, 20. Do you expect the power to come along at, at some point? Or no, he might be, you know, 25 could be his max. Or, or will he be like a Francisco Lindor kind of shortstop that small and somehow can generate a lot of power? I mean, 25 homers is still pretty impressive. That would make him one sure. of the top power hitting shortstops in the game. So, I mean, I think that's, that's a, that would be a wonderful power projection. What stood out with Tovar is even when he was in um, the Cal League when I saw him in 2021, as I mentioned it, he had some stock in his bat for a little guy. That's what really stood out was, you know, he wasn't a big guy. He was even smaller then just because, you know, a one year less of physical development and maturity. And he was, he was hitting balls hard. I mean, you heard it off the barrel. You know, there was a lot of deep flies to the track. And he said, if this guy just gets a little bit stronger, those balls are going to start going out. And he went up to Hartford and he did. I mean, hit for you know solid power there. Um, th there's no question he has the ability to impact a baseball, and especially when you get to play 81 games a year at Coors Field. Yeah, as long as he continues to develop and hone his approach, and, and especially once he really starts honing in on pitches he can drive, that's part of toning down that aggressiveness a little bit. Yeah, again, I mean, if he's a, a gold glove shortstop hitting 20 home runs, that's an all-star. That, that's one of the best shortstops in baseball. So, look, is he going to hit 30, 35? I, I wouldn't say that. Um, again, anything's possible. But if he hits 20, that's a great outcome. If he's hitting 25, 27, that's a really, really good outcome and, and would put him you know, right up there among the shortstop leaders in home runs every year. So um, he's, he's got a chance to be a really, really, really good player who's going to help the Rockies. And now it's just a matter of continuing his growth and development and just making the necessary strides. But he's already shown the ability to make them you know, pretty rapidly year over year, which is really promising. Yeah, he's definitely been in a lot of those National League Rookie of the Year Award conversations for 2023. Looking ahead, playing at Coors Field is obviously going to going to help his batting average just a little bit. And I'll learn about what it's like uh, with, with the Coors Field hangover on the road as well. Veen's another one of those guys where you look at him and you think, oh, yeah, we're, we're definitely going to see a lot of power. And we haven't seen a ton, you know, 15 in the, in the Cal League in, in uh, 2021. Uh, he had about 12 last year, if you, if you want to throw in his Arizona Fall League homer. He had, he had 13. But his speed has kind of almost come out of, out of nowhere. You, you, maybe you'd want the reverse, a guy who you thought was going to steal a lot of bases, uh, generate a lot more power than you expected. But he's been the opposite and, and has been just incredibly swift on the base paths. Is he someone that you could see maybe uh, having you know more career home runs than a Tovar? Let's say over over the next six years, will his power actually develop? Yeah. So the way Zach Veen's swing works and just his overall game, it's not like he's a big hulking slugger who's just going to hit tanks. He's more of just a really good, well-rounded player who's really athletic, does a lot of things well. He's going to be more of a, a balanced player, right? You know, 280, 20 bombs, you know, drive in 90 to 100, a lot of doubles while playing pretty good defense in the outfield and, and probably stealing 20 bases as well, which again, if you're a 2020 player and you're able to hit, you know, 260, 270, 280, that's a really good player. Again, Special. is he a 30, 30 guy? No, um, just the way his swing works. And, you know, again, he's, he's, he's young and he's certainly got some projection, but it's not like, you know, there's a big, you know, 
30 pounds of strength there still to go. He's more of a, a longer, leaner, lankier type, just his general build. Um, so again, I, I think with Zach Levine, again, you're not really looking at a guy who's going to be a big middle of the order slugger. It's going to be more that well-rounded, does everything really well. Um, and he's, he's going to have some power for sure, um, especially as he continues to mature, especially as he gets into course field. Um, but, but again, I, I wouldn't call him a, a slugger who's going to be hitting 30 bombs a year. It's going to be more, you know, he'll go 20, 20 with a good average and good defense and just be a really good, well-rounded all around baseball player, which, which is very valuable. Benny Montgomery had there, there's some similarities with him and Venet, at least as far as height, Montgomery, you know, a little bit lankier, uh, probably a little bit more raw, obviously coming out of the, the high school circuit there in, in, in Pennsylvania where he, you know, he wasn't, you know, tr playing travel ball like, like Zach Veen was uh, up and down, you know, the, the, the south, uh, the southeast uh, there in Florida. But Montgomery was a guy who, at least for me, I think answered a lot of questions uh, towards the second half last year. He had that hitch in his swing. Uh, like, like you said, I, I'm not a scout, but seeing him at spring training in, in 2022, uh, it was pretty pronounced that hitch. Uh, but if you if you look at some of the video from the second half, it looked like he solved some of that, and he was you know a real power player for the Grizzlies uh, in their run in the second half last season. Uh, do do you have you know less concerns about Montgomery you know figuring out that that hit tool because his glove you know obviously is something that's definitely going to get him to the majors at worst case scenario. Um, I would say well I, I'll, I'll address that in a second. Um. I've looked at this, even, you know, guys who are great defenders, they still have to hit to get to the majors. Um, sure. Even the guys who are fourth outfielders in the majors, you go back and look, they hit 280 in the minors. Um, yeah. So it, he's going to have to hit to get to the majors. Um, there's plenty of great glove and speed guys um, in the outfield. So I wouldn't say there's a guarantee just based on his glove. Yeah. With Benny Montgomery, it's, it's a little more wait and see um, just because it was a it was a short you know season for him. He missed a lot of time with injuries, so there weren't. It's not a huge sample to work with. The other thing about the California League last year, um, just to be blunt, the pitching was absolutely horrendous. It was the worst anyone could remember seeing, um, wow. especially in the second half, because the guys who showed you anything at all got moved out of there pretty much by the All Star break at the latest. So, you know, the the pitching he was hitting against at the end of the year was horrendously poor. We're talking a lot of flat 90, 91 uh, with you know no secondary or guys coming out of the bullpen throwing 96, 98 with no idea where it was going. So in general, offensive numbers in the Cal League last year, you want to take them with a grain of salt. That's especially true for a guy who plays his home games in Fresno, which is a hitter's paradise. So there's a lot more wait and see with Benny Montgomery. Again, it was good to see you know some of the pro progress he made, some of the strides he made. Um, but there's still a long way to go. And I think getting a full, healthy season out of him this coming year and seeing what he can do over the course of, you know, obviously he's not going to play all 140, but 120 games, you know, something like that, um, especially if he moves up and starts facing better competition in a less clearly hitter-friendly environment. I, I think we're going to get a much better sense of, okay, this is where Benny Montgomery is really at. Again, it was encouraging to see some things last year, but it's still wait and see as opposed to, okay, he's good. It's no longer an issue. How much of that, you know, lack of, of pitching there in the second half, I think we talked about this maybe briefly in, when, uh, when I saw you in, in San Diego at the, at the trade deadline where the, the Rockies did nothing, unfortunately, and the Padres did everything. Um, but this idea that, you know, because of the new minor league structure with going from 160 to 120 teams, that may be a complex league, Dominican summer league, that pipeline to, to low a, you know, maybe it isn't quite there. And, and, that might explain some of it, or was it just you know a bad bad crop of of guys that were there in the Cal League in the second half? Uh, it's both. So there's no question the pitching at low A overall, the pitching and defense have really really taken dramatic steps back since reorganization. And just to be frank, they were never that great to begin with pre-organization. Pitching and, and defense were not great in low A. So you would always see some inflated offensive numbers because a lot of balls that were being ruled hits that would not have been hits. Um, with a major league official score, balls getting through that would not have gotten through in high A or double A, plus the caliber of pitching was really bad, and it's gotten even worse since reorganization. So um, it's it's really really rough in low A in general right now. The quality of the pitching, the quality of the defense, so it's it's easy for guys to rack up big offensive numbers, especially if you're in a hitter friendly environment like a Fresno. But on top of that. So that's low A in general. Um, you know, every year, you know, every league, it's it's cyclical. Some years a league is loaded, some years a league is stacked, some years it's pretty down, 
Some years it's great hitters, but not pitching and vice versa. So every league, again, it's cyclical. Um, last year in particular in the California League, not just in the second half, the entire season, um, the pitching was just horrendous. It was really, really, really bad. Um, you know, we don't do our league top 20 prospects at BA anymore. If we did and we were ranking a league top 20, I think I would have been hard pressed to put a single pitcher on the list, um, maybe wow. one or two. It was really, really, really poor all around. So it's both low way the pitching and defense have really regressed as a whole since organization because a lot of guys who previously would have gone to short season ball in the rockets case you know grand junction you know that kind of that middle step between um the complex well the rockets didn't have a complex league team but generally speaking the level between the complex league to full season ball that short season um that's gone now so a lot of guys who their talent level is more short season are now up in low a and it's it's pretty apparent the gap. So um, that's really kind of been the issue there. And I would just encourage everyone, as much as there's a lot of talent in the Cal League last year, with Jordan Lawler and James Wood and Jackson Merrill and you know, all these guys who are super talented and you, you don't have to be a scout to see it, um, you still want to kind of pump the brakes a little bit just because they were getting to feast on some horrendous pitching. You kind of want to see them prove it at high A before you say, okay, I'm definitely buying this. Yeah, take it with a grain of salt. Almost makes Rockies fans, I think, feel a little bit better about uh, the the pitching staff that was in Fresno. Again, you know, one first half, second half, best record. You know, they had some some guys that had you know pretty solid years. So um, that that explains why that group was uh, was so special. Pins and Aces is a very special official, special and official golf apparel company of the DNVR. Another Colorado company. Love their gear. They got polos, hats. They got some Rockies colorway gear as well coming out. And of course, they've got the beer and seltzer sleeve. So you can throw that thing in your bag. It'll keep it cool throughout the entire round. And right now, Pins and Aces is giving you 15% off when you use code DNVR off your first offer. And on top of that, you're going to get free shipping at pinsandaces.com. And if you need tickets to an event, baseball season is going to be here. Spring training. I mean, we we are less than five weeks from players, pitchers, and catchers outfielders, you name it, all the positions before they start reporting to camp. And there's going to be games about two weeks right after that. So game time tickets is the way to go, even for spring training events, uh, concerts, football, postseason, game time. They got a great situation going on over there because if you wait until about 60 minutes up until the start of the event, you can get up to 60% off the face value of that ticket. So you can be very smart and very selective with game time tickets. 15 million folks have used it, have downloaded the game time app to score the best seats. But you can help us out a little bit by hitting that link in our description to save. Well, in our chat, Kyle, uh, we got someone from Nathaniel that remembers you working for the Daily Press in Victorville. Do you remember that? I do. My first <laughs> job out of college was working for the Victorville Daily Press. I was covering uh, local high schools and the High Desert Mavericks, RIP. That was my first job out of college. Yep. Two years. Wow. And RIP Bakersville Blaze as well. Yes. Yes. Seeing them, uh, both those franchises fold was sad, but you understood yeah. it. High Desert was uh, in bad shape even when I was there. It was actually funny. I was there when they were about to move to Ch uh, to uh, Chico. The deal was done. They were getting set to move. They had even ordered um, some special bobbleheads with Pat Gillick, oh. uh, who's a Chico native. They had them in their <laughs> office. I actually got one as a souvenir, and uh, I lost it in some move at some point oh. or another. But they were they were ready to go, and then uh, California passed. Uh, well, there was a, a court ruling. Um, Governor Jerry Brown at the time um, uh, had put forth the legislation. There was a court ruling that eliminated the state redevelopment agencies, and that killed the proposed stadium in Chico. So they ended up staying in High Desert for a few more years. But yeah, I mean, that was you know what it was. It was an interesting place to uh, cut my teeth as a, as a baseball writer. You know, it was one of those things where I. I treated it as a minor league beat covering the Mavericks and the Cal League like a major league beat and kind of prepared me to move on to bigger and better things. Oh, that's awesome. Would they have been just been the Chico Mavericks or do they have another nickname picked out? I want to say the Outlaws sounds familiar. I want to say the Chico Outlaws, but I, that could be wrong. Um, but yeah, no, the move, the move was, was set. It was done. And then wow. that, that got canned. But yeah, no, I remember they had in their office in Atalanto, you know, the box of the bobbleheads with Pat Gillick, you know, because he's a, a Chico native. Oh. Uh, it was, he's like signing a contract in the bobblehead. And I... <laughs> Once it once it got canned, I they were just giving them away to people like Do you want one. I was like sure, so I took one and I kind of wish I still had it because 
would have been kind of a fun uh, fun story to tell and write about. But sadly, I think the head broke off in some box at some point in one of my moves. All right, RIP the bobblehead too, as as well. That's that's a bummer. Uh, Chris asking about uh, the Rule Five draft. I kind of caught up with you a little bit there uh, at the winter meetings. Uh, there's a lot of names. Uh, there are a lot of baseball players. Uh, names that I, I didn't know almost any of the names because again, these these are guys who play for the the Akron Rubber Ducks. I know you you guys keep track of of all that stuff. Was there anybody that um, from the Rocky system that you know you were maybe surprised? you know, didn't, didn't get a call, you know, maybe Willie McIver has been a name for the last two years, you know, good defending catcher, but was there anyone that jumped out either on the major or minor league side that you go, Hey, you know, this guy's not so bad. Not going to, maybe not going to be an all-star, but I'm, I'm almost surprised no one, you know, maybe wanted to, to give that person a, a look or an opportunity. Not really. And that's nothing against the Rockies. Sure. Yeah. That's just, you know, the rule five draft. Um, yeah. we have some people on our staff who love it, but you know, look, realistically, you go back and look, um, you know, way back in the day, Johan Santana was a rule five pick. That obviously turned out great. You know, Joaquin Soria was another one who's been successful. More recently, Tyler Wells, Garrett Whitlock. But for the most part, you know, 98% of rule five picks, it just nothing happens. They end up getting returned and, you know, they either go on with their careers or a team brings them up, stashes them, and it kind of messes up their development path and they never really become anything. So, Again, it's, it's, you know, there's a couple guys that were taking, you know, Thad Ward's interesting because he's upper level. He's had some success, you know, could he be a swing man? Yeah, I see that. You know, Ryan Noda has been to AAA, has power. The ace took him second. You know, there's a couple guys you could see, okay, maybe they end up helping in some way, shape or form, but um, it's just not a, a significant talent source in terms of getting guys who really make any impact at all, whether it's even, you know, everyday impact or just bench impact. So you know, I wasn't, sh- I'm never shocked to see like, oh, wow, that guy didn't get taken because so much of this is just throwing a dart, hoping for, you know, something to happen, you know, the, the 1% chance something happens. So, um, sorry, it's a long way the way of saying, no, I, I wasn't really surprised, but that's not a rocky thing. That's just a rule five draft thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a reason the guy didn't get protected by his, his own team on, on the 40 man Ryan note, as you said, classic Oakland A's kind of selection there and and a classic Dodgers guy too he's just in AAA and Dodgers like nah we, we don't need that guy but you can go and, and have a nice career uh, elsewhere the Rockies don't do anything during the rule five draft other than draft a player then then trade them away um Tommy Canely and and Jordan Sheffield are, are the more more recent guys Luis A Gonzalez so literally they've only had three guys that they've ever drafted and have stuck around are there other teams that kind of just punt on the rule five draft because as you said there's not as much upside and, and, and maybe the risk is too much or just too much of a headache, not, not enough juice for the squeeze. Maybe it's more about where the team is kind of, you know, in their, in their competitive cycle, right. For teams who are rebuilding at the very bottom. And it's like, you know what, our roster is filled with a lot of AAA filler guys as is maybe this guy, you know, let's take him and, you know, can be the last man, in our bullpen. We like him better than what else is out there right now. Um, Sure. I mean, you know, an example I'll give is, you know, the Padres, you'll remember when they, you know, kind of jettisoned everyone um, after their attempt at competing in 2015 didn't work. And then 2016, um, middle by the middle of that year, they traded everyone who was still remaining for the most part. And then they went and they were very, very active in the Rule 5 draft. They picked their own player and acquired uh, the top, other top two picks in that draft and trades. And yeah, like three guys, so- right? Yeah. And then there was another year they carried four Rule 5 picks on their 25-man roster. I remember covering that team, Jabari Blash and Josh Martin and guys like that. Jabari um, Blash, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Blash when, when I, was a, I was a beat writer for the Potters for two years, so you remember all the, the random dudes. I remember being at the NLCS covering it that year, this year with Dennis Lynn. We were talking about the days of Christian Friedrich and Paul Clemens and Jared Kozart and all the terrible players we covered as beat writers. Um, anyway, it's a side tangent. but Christian Friedrich, former Rocky, so thank you. We appreciate that. Get a yeah, shot yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, again, when the Potters were rebuilding and and making you know, you know, very clear that they were tanking, they were going to try and get high picks, and you know, the major league roster was trying to field a, a team that can physically get through the season. Um, yeah, they were very very active in the Rule Five draft. Then when they started looking to compete, they haven't made a pick. It hasn't been worth it to them because they're aiming higher. So it's really more about where a team is individually as opposed to this team partakes in the rule five draft this team doesn't um it's just about the team individually and where they are yeah yeah it makes sense as as far as the situation goes you bring up the padres 
is their spending spree going to end anytime soon? I mean, you got to think we've, we have never really, really seen a small market club spend like this in general, but not to do it. This is like the third or fourth year in a row, and they still got a lot of guys signed. I mean, Machado, he's got to be at least 80% to be to be an opt-out candidate. How how much longer do you see the Padres kind of being in this pool with uh, with with the big spenders like the Dodgers, Yankees, you know, you you name it, going out and, and spending top dollar for free agents? As long as they have an owner willing to do it. And Peter Sadler has shown he's willing to do it. I, I do think it's important, and, and I say this as a San Diego native, and I, I've talked to people about this. San Diego is not a small market. It was a small market because their previous owners were cheap. San Diego is the eighth most populous city in the U.S. You all, it's a very, very large city, and you have a ton of money there. You have five of the wealthiest zip codes in the United States within about 30 mile, 30 minute drive of Petco Park. Um, so you have a ton of people. You have a ton of money. It's very sports invested city when teams are good because when they're not good they're not going to waste their money they're going to go to the beach but um, when teams are good i mean petco park was rocking and as one team official told me they're printing money right now you know especially after they acquired juan soto there's a lot of people and a lot of money in san diego people focus on the media market 27th and dma but there's two key things they miss with that the first is that doesn't include all the fans uh down below the border in tijuana which is an enormous part of their fan base and the second flaw with that is that really only matters for their tv deal and their tv deal they get paid very very well uh, they make about the same as the Mets make from their TV deal annually. Oh, wow. So it doesn't, their, their media market size doesn't really functionally matter. Um, they have a great TV deal that gives them a lot of money. They have a, they play in a very, very populous city. That's a major city and a city that has a lot of disposable income. So there's always been this potential, but you know, previous owners didn't have the money. John Moores was going through a divorce and stripped the payroll. Uh, Jeff Morad just didn't have the money to begin with. Um, they got someone like Peter Seidler who has the money. He sees the potential. He sees everything around him and says, yeah, we need to spend to get these fans invested because they're not going to waste their time if we're not you know, willing to invest our money. Why should they, would they invest theirs? Um, but once he did, they, they've started to see, you know, dividends. Again, just, you know, being, you know, from San Diego and seeing it. I mean, these last two years, especially in this last year, especially, I mean, the stadium was packed. I mean, San Diego Petco Park was rocking during the postseason and, Again, you know, acquiring all these players that sells more tickets, that sells more jerseys, that's more money coming in. And at the end of the day, there's always been this potential there. Um, this idea that's a small market, it's not. It's more of a mid market at worst, and you have an owner willing to spend like that and, and even higher. There's no reason it's going to stop as long as he's willing to spend. That August second trade deadline day when Juan Soto played, that I I, I don't know if I've ever been in, in, a, in a ballpark that had like that much use. It was definitely postseason juice. All right, last question to get you out of here. With Cueto now on the Marlins, do the Padres get one of these Marlins starters uh, that they've been kicking around dealing possibly? Or Nelson Cruz? I, I don't get that one, but do you, do you see them maybe making one of those two moves or, or which one might be more likely for them to, to make? Well, never doubt that A.J. Preller will make a move at some point or another. Um, I, I think in terms of acquiring you know, one of the Marlins starters, depending who it is, obviously Pablo Lopez will cost more than Trevor Rogers, but or Braxton Garrett, um, and Sandy Alcantara is not going anywhere. But you know, the Padres have, have really emptied out the farm system for the most part. Oh, yeah. They still have Jackson Merrill, who's very, very good. Um, you know, Could they convince the Marlins to take the package of – you know, Hassan Kim or Trent Grisham along with Luis Camposano for Pablo Lopez? Probably not. That's not going to be enough to lead it. Um, and I don't know if they're going to be willing to part with Jackson Merrill. So, you know, could it happen? Sure. Um, you know, all it takes is the Marlins to think more highly of, of one of their guys and maybe the industry. And there's always, you know, all it takes is one team to see guys better than everyone else. And that's enough to pull the trigger on a deal. So it's certainly possible, but there are other teams who have more to offer Again, you know, the Dodgers are also in the mix of, of maybe looking to acquire another starter. And they have a lot more they can offer in terms of prospects and, and even in some you know cases kind of young big leaguers guys ready, ready to help now and contribute now than the Padres do. So, you know, it depends what the Dodgers are willing to offer and, and who the Marlins like. But um, it's possible the Padres make a deal. Again, other teams have more to offer, which – if the Marlins are, you know, smart and, and play their cards right, you'd probably want to make sure you get some really, really good players for a guy like Pablo Lopez and other teams can just beat the Padres offer. 
regarding Nelson Cruz, you know, the Potters have long been kind of infatuated with him. They just love him, you know, who he is, his personality as a player. And look, you know, they signed Matt Carpenter to be a DH. He's had a lot of health issues, um, you know, bringing Nelson Cruz to maybe, you know, be almost the platoon DH, the lefty masher, um, especially if Carpenter continues to struggle to stay healthy, you know, Maybe that could work. And, you know, the clubhouse presence combined with his ability to maybe hit lefties as a DH, the carpenter, you know, does the bulk of the work against righties. That's what it would be. You know, will it happen? Maybe. We'll see. It's just, again, it's just going to come down to, you know, if another team can offer him more money or more playing time, we'll find out. Kyle, we haven't even talked about the loaded Arizona Diamondbacks farm system. We'll have to have <laughs> you back on another time, another 45 minute convo about the NL West. Uh, appreciate you taking this time out. Go ahead and, and plug away everything on Baseball America, Twitter, all that great stuff, all that wonderful content that uh, you guys put out there. Yeah, we're continuing continuing to roll out our top 10 prospects for all 30, 30 organizations. We're almost at the end of it. Uh, I believe we wrapped up the NL West today, and then we're going to uh, finish up with our final final AL West teams here in the coming few days. Then we're going to have our top 100 prospects uh, coming out next week. Ooh. Late next week, I have the 2023 BA Top 100, which is always a fun day, and a lot of content surrounding that. You know, which teams have the most top 100 prospects? Who are some players that you know are on the top 100, but there's question marks about? Um, you know, who are some prospects who were former top 100? You know, where are they now? How did their careers turn out? So, a lot of good stuff coming up this week, next week. Uh, it's all top 100 stuff and top 10 prospects, and then. Uh, once we roll into February, we're going to have a ton of stuff for the college season, uh, college preview, every conference. We're going to look at the top um, players, you know, top draft prospects in college baseball this year as selected by scouting directors across the game. So a lot of good content there. And then before you know it, we'll be into uh, spring training and uh, the World Baseball Classic. I'll be leading up our coverage of that. So we've got a lot nice. of good stuff up now, a lot more to come. So definitely keep an eye out at uh, BaseballAmerica.com. There's, there's never a, a dull time of the year for Baseball America. You guys are getting it covered there. That's exciting. I'm going to be setting my alarm for 6 a.m. all next week, refreshing my computer. When's that top 100 list drop in? Uh, that's the spot to go uh, uh, for Baseball America, baseballamerica.com, at Kyle A. Glazer on Twitter. Uh, at DNVR underscore Rockies is where you can find us on Twitter. At Patrick D. Lyons is my handle. Uh, this has been wonderful. Again, Kyle, appreciate it. But uh, in true baseball terms, Momentum, the momentum that we have, unfortunately, Kyle, it's only as good as our next show. So we'll have to see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. on the DNVR Sports Channel on YouTube.